Welcome to Season 2, Episode 1 of Sprott Gold Talk Radio. I'm your host, Ed Coyne, Senior Managing Director at Sprott Asset Management. I'm pleased to be joined today by our very own Doug Groh, Senior Portfolio Manager of Sprott Gold Equity Fund, as well as other investment vehicles within Sprott. For today's topic, we're going to be talking about the value of mining equities. Uh, Doug, first and foremost, thanks for joining us today on Sprott Gold Talk Radio. Well, thanks, Ed. It's great to be here. Good to see you again. It's good to see you. For those listeners, we're actually looking at each other through a screen, and that's why we're seeing each other. Uh, but for all of you today, I'm, I'm excited to be on to our second season and looking forward to going into some deep topics about the value of mining equities. So, Doug, before we dive into all things related to mining equities and the value of their current balance sheets, please tell us a little bit about yourself and also give us a little bit of a, an insight into what you're doing at Sprott, kind of on a day-to-day basis and how you work with the rest of the investment team. Sure. Well, thanks, Ed. It's been about two years now since I joined Sprott in uh, 2020, uh, January of that year, and uh, it's it's really been a great, great experience. Focusing on the precious metal equities and the investment effort here, similar to what I was doing at Tocqueville Asset Management for over 17 years. In the 1990s, I was uh, involved in investment banking with uh, J.P. Morgan and Merrill Lynch and ING. And at that time, I was really focused in both banking and equity research and investing in the base materials sector. Uh, So a little bit different from precious metals, but on the same vein where we were looking at the value creation potential from the various dynamics that uh, managers can realize value from, whether it's the assets or perhaps their strategy or perhaps opportunities in the market using their balance sheet to create value. In the 1980s, I was uh, first hired as a precious metals analyst after uh, graduate school uh, from the University of Texas, where I Uh, focused on mineral economics. And uh, prior to that, I was involved in the oil field uh, as a geologist. But in the 1980s, I I also was a precious metals investor, focusing on a number of portfolios uh, that invested in precious metal explorers and developers and miners, similar to what I'm doing now. So more than half of my career has really been spent in uh, precious metal investing. And I know we've been really thrilled to have you and, and actually the whole team, you know, along with John Hathaway, be part of Sprott now. And it's hard to believe it's actually been two years. I remember when we were just getting to know each other a few years back and uh, certainly a, a phenomenal addition to the to the firm at large. Well, let's let's dive into it here. You know, 2021 was an interesting year for the Fed and their ongoing accommodative policies, which continue to provide investors with double digit returns in the S&P. Yet, um, even with these record debt levels and stubborn inflation that we've seen in the market, precious metals, as well as precious metals equities, continue to be in more of a holding pattern. To start this off, I really have a two-part question for you. Uh, First, can you comment on on, on why you think both physical gold and silver have not done better? Um, We get that question all the time. And then the second part of the question would be, given that there is change in the air, again, just in January alone, there's more posturing by the Fed and so forth. Can you give us an outlook on what you think may or may not happen and why for 2022 for both the physical side of the market as well as for mining equities? Sure. Well, that's a great, great way to start. Uh, And I think, you know, looking back at this past year, some precious metal investors might have been disappointed that uh, gold basically went sideways. But, you know, if you look at gold for the long term, it actually has done very well over the last number of years. In fact, Last year, uh, gold averaged about $1,800 an ounce, about 1.5% better than the average in the prior year, in uh, 2020. So gold really did pretty well. From the beginning of the year to the end of the year, uh, price point to price point, gold was down about 4.5%. But on average, gold was up in over the prior year. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to put in perspective uh, what the view is on gold, whether it's a short-term view or a longer-term view, uh, that becomes very important because I think it'll lead investors to recognize that there's opportunities in certain markets at certain times. The price is very determined, I think, by technical activities, by the interest rate environment, by the U.S. dollar, dollar's relative strength or weakness. Those are things that happen day-to-day that affect the gold price. But over the long period of time, Gold has shown itself to be a real, real important store of value. 
And, you know, that's what we've witnessed over the past couple of years. And, and I think that's important for investors to recognize gold exposure provides that diversification for the long period of time, not just a day-to-day trading opportunity. I think with what's in front of us for 2022 with regard to gold, I think we'll continue to see the technical environment affect the gold price. It'll probably be continue to be relatively volatile. I can see a trading range of around 1750 to 1850 in the next several months. I think that uh, there's going to be an attempt uh, sometime during the year to break out above $2,000 an ounce. But, uh, you know, I think that's maybe sh- somewhat of a short-term thinking. The long-term thinking should be that gold serves a purpose as a diversifier in a portfolio. And the long-term value of, of gold is held by its very nature of, of being scarce and, and being an alternative to other, other asset classes in the marketplace. You know, I think with regard to the precious metals equities outlook, you know, last year was a pretty good year for them. Granted, the equities were down, but the companies did very well. They built up their balance sheets. Their cash flows continued to show real high quality. The, the, the margins are doing quite well. Um, there's been a restraint in terms of asset allocation. We saw a number of mergers and acquisitions last year, which is a really a, a common theme in our space. And, and um, th- that will continue to be the case, I think, this year, probably even more so this year. I would expect more M&A activity for the reasons that the balance sheets are in such great shape. Companies have a little bit more flexibility and ability to go out into the world now that Things are kind of becoming somewhat normalized with whatever normal is in terms of COVID. I think people are understanding how they can operate now and get out and do due diligence on assets. And uh, we did see a number of deals last year. So um, there is a method to go out and, and do an analysis on making an acquisition. So we'll see that, I'm sure. I, I also expect to see you know, relatively good margins continue into the end of the year. The gold price here at $1,800 an ounce offers many producers an exceptional price in terms of their cost profile, which can be $1,250 to $1,300 an ounce. So, you know, really quite good margins. And over the last couple of years, we've seen the sector reduce its, its debt significantly. So quite a few companies are cash positive or negative net debt, as, as it were, on their balance sheet. So in real good shape in that regard. The question sort of becomes, where's the audience for investing in gold equities? And and I think that what's now unraveling in the marketplace with the recognition that the Federal Reserve and other central banks will be raising interest rates uh, to try to counter inflation, which has probably gotten away from them, it's very likely that we're going to see some significant disruptions in the broader markets where investors are perhaps not positioned for higher rates, where equity values do decline because rates are higher, where investors maybe don't have alternatives that they were looking at a year ago, looking at the high growth names. In this type of situation, gold should do quite well. It, again, offers a good alternative to some of the mainstream investments investors are used to. You mentioned two words that I think are worth repeating, and one is just the the word the Fed. It does seem to me that the Fed is playing a bit of chicken uh, with the economy. You know, first stressing that inflation is transitory, then making a lot of comments about we're dropping the word transitory, now talking about tapering and, and eventually raising rates. You know, there's certainly going to be disruption in the market because gold loves nothing more than disruption. Gold loves nothing more than uncertainty. And it feels like this market this year is going to be riddled with a lot of uncertainty. So it'll be interesting to see what the Fed does. You know, I'm reminded of 2015 and even 2016 when the Fed attempted to tighten for the first time in a long time. And the first half of that year, gold was up over 20 and the equities were up over 100. By no means am I prognosticating future returns, but it's just interesting to see that rising rates don't automatically have a negative impact on gold. The reason behind that, probably more important than anything else. So how closely do you look at Fed action, what they're doing with rates, what they're doing with with debt purchasing? How closely do you look at that and try to forecast what may or may not happen to gold 
or do you even bother forecasting and just simply look for the best balance sheets out there, the best companies out there? Walk us through that a little bit and how you think about that. Well, you know, certainly the gold price has a lot of impact on the profitability of the gold miners. So we certainly have to watch what's going on with the gold price. It is an indicator. Um, it does send a message uh, to the marketplace. But, you know, the gold price moves daily, obviously. And we're not necessarily traders on just a move in the gold price or a move for a week or, or two weeks or, or three weeks. We are long-term investors. And perhaps to answer your question, how do we think about our investing process with regard to exposure to the, the mining equities? If you step back and look at what a mining company is able to do, they're able to create value in a number of different ways. And so for us, we want to understand how they do create value. And the first and foremost obvious place for them to create value is in their assets, in the geology that they own or operate, the machines and the, the mill and the, the facilities that they're producing gold from. This is, uh, you know, where the value is coming from. Now, as part of that, their strategy in how they realize value, their financial position, whether it's their balance sheet or their cash flow or their ability to raise capital, those are all important considerations in terms of you know realizing value creation. But each company that we've made an investment in, each one is a little bit unique, but it has something in terms of that profile that I just described, whether it's the geology or the strategy or perhaps their financial position where value is created. So what, what we try to do is identify what the market is valuing. What's, what is the market giving them credit for? And what is the market perhaps missing in terms of the opportunity for value creation? Perhaps the market is discounting the company's geology or discounting the strategy or perhaps not giving enough credit for the balance sheet. And so we try to understand how things could be different for that company and what might change to create more value for that company in the marketplace. And, and that's really key for us is to find that differential between the reality and the potential. And when we find that differential, then it's a matter of digging deeper to the point where we have a conviction that the perception on that value can change in the marketplace and create a different value reality. And, and I think we've seen that happen, and it can be a very powerful force in terms of value creation. Last year, we had a couple guests on our show, one of them being our own Paul Wong, who highlighted the fact that mining companies today are operating differently than they have in the past. And I know you touched on it a little bit with the quality of the balance sheets, with less debt, more cash rich, some paying dividends and so forth. From an asset manager standpoint, from a, from a research standpoint, are you looking at these companies differently than maybe you did 10 or 15 years ago? Are you taking different things under consideration that maybe you hadn't in the past because the companies are operating slightly differently than maybe they did pre, say, 2011, the previous peak in the market? Has anything changed in the way you evaluate these companies? Yes, I, I would say that that's certainly true. Uh, and, and there's a number of things that have changed. The, the market's changed for one thing, so we have to think differently. One of the changes, you know, compared to 10 years ago is companies were positioning themselves for growth and that got them into trouble. They were positioning themselves for very aggressive growth and they leveraged up their balance sheet. And as a result, when the gold price corrected, they were not able to address their obligations on the balance sheet or realize the growth potential they had envisioned. So it was a bit of a misalignment with the time. Uh, gold prices were high, but their plans were long-term plans they could not execute. Now, in this environment, in the in 2020s, the management teams are more focused on a quality balance sheet, as I mentioned earlier, but also things that they can achieve and be successful with. So instead of building big plans or big, big uh, facilities or what have you, there's a little bit more of incremental growth which will add value over the long term. A more staged approach to spending, to adding to the company's profile. Um, there's a much more cautious approach in terms of valuing the resources and the reserves that a company extracts over time. So there's a, a greater conservatism among management teams 
And I think more responsibility as a result. That's one aspect. Another aspect is geopolitical risks have risen significantly over the last 10 or 15 years. It's always been the case that there's geopolitical risk, but it's become more pronounced, I would say, over the last 10 years as countries want to recognize the value from their resources, they're imposing more royalties or taxes or in some ways nationalization in some form or fashion. And and we have seen a, uh, some of those episodes in the last year become a little bit more pronounced. So as investors, we're becoming more concerned about where the assets are located. You know, years ago when we would start analyzing a company, we would ask about the geology because that's where the the initial value comes from. And that still is very important to us. But now we also need to understand right away, can you extract value from this investment thesis. In other words, can you take value out of the country or out of the deposit or realize value from the strategy that the company is is trying to deploy? And so we are more inclined to go to safer jurisdictions, whether that's North America being Canada and and US and Mexico and 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 right now that's the biggest biggest exposure we have in the portfolio. Uh, we have less exposure to Africa than we did years ago and in other parts of the world. So that's that's become uh, more of a concern for us. And then there's another element, too. Just in the last three or four years, uh, the investment community has become more concerned with environmental, social, and governance compliance. And so that, too, has become a little bit more of an articulated message for us. It's always been important for us to see a company operate with a great business model. And a great business model means that they are they are following the law, they are doing what they say they do, and they're committed to shareholder returns. And and while we've always been concerned with that, now it's becoming a little bit more structured within the ESG analysis and framework where there's some specific questions and concerns with regard to the environment or the social commitment a company has or governance and the proper structure of a board and, and representation that is on a board. Those two are, have always been important to us, but they're a little bit more pronounced. And again, I come back to that idea that we're looking for good business models and a good business model is addressing these issues as appropriate for that company and their their activities. So we want to see that management teams are are complying with uh, requirements with regard to the environment and the social obligations as well as governance. And uh, so that's a little bit different. Well, I'm glad you addressed ESG because I, I agree, you know, that's that's something that we've seen in a lot of our clients, you know, particularly on the uh, on the institutional side, on the endowment sides and so forth. And now even um, in the larger family offices that we deal with, they all have a bit of an ESG overlay where appropriate. And, you know, I know you and I have talked many times offline about how in many ways, because of the nature of the way you have all made stock selections in the past of the higher quality businesses, before ESG had a brand or a name, we we're already applying some of those things. And now I like your word structured. It's become a much more structured approach. You can't seem to get through an investment conference or conversation without ESG coming up. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the investment itself within the space. You know, arguably, you would say that the physical market is sort of a risk off trade. It's a natural hedge trade. But the equities in general would be, in my mind, more of a risk on trade because you are still dealing with equities, you're dealing with management, you're dealing with balance sheets and so forth. And one of the things we've noticed in the last you know, decade or so is that it's become a much more crowded universe with cryptos, with SPACs, with different investments out there. There's much more of a universe of ways to take a risk on trade. So you know, maybe helping a listener think about how mining stocks can potentially be value add in this current market as you're looking for ways to potentially replace some other equity that they own and continue to have a bit of a risk on trade or an opportunistic allocation in their portfolio. How should an investor incorporate mining stocks into that sleeve of their, their diversified portfolio? How, how, how should they think about that? Yeah, that's that's a great question and, and a good point. Uh, and I think that when I started out in the precious metal space, you know, some 30 years ago, you could either buy 
a gold coin or a gold fund or a gold stock. Right. And now there's so many different options. You can buy ETFs. You can buy gold stocks. You can buy funds. You can buy a blend. You could buy options. You could trade in the futures market, whatever. And there's more accessibility to the different markets. So um, there's a lot of different ways that uh, you can get exposure to gold and the dynamics that uh, gold presents. I think with regard to the mining space, um, to your question, the the opportunity here, I, th- I think, is several fold. The mining companies are extracting a natural resource and creating value in the process. So if you think about that, those companies that are making discoveries are creating significant value when they make a discovery. And so there's that opportunity for investors in a mining company or exploration company to participate in that eureka, as it were, when when gold is discovered. Which is very exciting, and that can see a multiple valuation increase when that discovery is is made. Another dynamic is certainly the profits that these companies make. Um, When the gold price moves, profits can expand or contract, and some investors are intrigued by the leverage to the precious metal price. And so for some investors, they want to play that price leverage And so the gold mining sector provides that opportunity to participate in price leverage, price profit leverage, which I think is sort of unique because it can be a very dramatic move. And here, too, investors can realize a lot of value in a short period of time. And likewise, to be fair, values can contract very significantly in in a short period of time. So there's a risk and a reward, and one has to pay attention to that. You know, I think another element is – In this sector, there's a lot of mergers and acquisition activity. And just by the nature and the structure of the industry, where the industry depletes its resource, it has to replace that resource with with a new geology or acquired geology or some other alternative means of of producing gold. So we see a lot of M&A activity to address that dynamic, where a lot of small companies are not able to produce gold in, on a scale that the larger ones are. The larger ones are maybe a little bit more capable in terms of their financing or flexibility to, to realize the gold in a, G, uh, in a deposit. And so we see the larger companies acquire the smaller ones. Or maybe there's two midsize that come together to become more relevant in the marketplace. Or perhaps... Um, There's a property sale that makes sense for one company that wants to sell its property and use its capital for something else. So there's a there's a number of different, you know, say, card games, as it were, that are being played here where investors can bet their money on the outcome. It's a dynamic space in that regard. So there's there's a lot of different opportunities here in the mining space where, you know, to go back to your earlier question, you know, you can buy gold ETFs or gold coins or uh, what have you, what you're participating in in those investments is the price move. And there's nothing wrong with participating in the price move. With the mining equities, you're participating in the price move, but there's other elements of value creation or other valuation metrics that are at play where you can realize value. And And I think that's the interesting dynamic. There's other avenues for value creation. Well, the value creation, I, I agree, is key. And, you know, some people have always just simply said, you know, gold equities are a levered trade to the price of gold. But to your point, there's so much more to that with management and, and certainly now with, with the strength of the balance sheets. Before we end today's podcast, are there any final thoughts you would like to leave our listeners with before we go on to wrapping this up? You know, this year is going to be an interesting year with regard to what the Fed does and how responsive they can actually be to inflation and the economy. It's very likely we're going to see some upsets, and I think that's where gold presents itself as a a dynamic winner when the market gets disrupted. It's also important to recognize that gold should be part of a portfolio for the long term. And while price action can be disturbing on a daily basis, Investors have to keep in mind their precious metal exposure is exposure for the long term as a diversifier 
to other risks in the marketplace. So I, I guess, you know, I'd leave you with the idea that as much as the daily gold price or precious metals price can be exciting, sometimes, you know, very positively exciting and sometimes very disappointing, investors should recognize it's the long term that becomes more important uh, really to the investment process. Well, I think that's always a wise thing to say and, and for investors to think about. You know, this is a marathon, not a sprint for sure. And the goal is to stay invested in the market. And I think gold certainly helps you do that. Well, Doug, thank you for joining us today on Sprott Gold Talk Radio. What I would say to our listeners out there who'd like to learn more about the value of mining equities, you know, we're constantly doing white papers and interviews and so forth. You know, we encourage you to visit us at Sprott.com. That's S-P-R-O-T-T dot com. For more information on all things mining, all things gold, all things silver. Welcome to season two. We're excited to have this still going. And I'm your host, Ed Coyne, and, and thank you for listening to Sprock Gold Talk Radio. You have been listening to the Gold Talk Podcast by Sprott Inc. For more information and insights on precious metals investing, please visit Sprott.com. This podcast should not be copied, distributed, published, or reproduced whole or in part. The information contained in this podcast does not constitute research or recommendation from any Sprott entity to the listener. Neither Sprott nor any of its affiliates make any representation or warranty as to the accuracy or completeness of the statements or any information contained in this podcast. And any liability, therefore, including in respect of direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage is expressly disclaimed. The views expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of Sprott, and Sprott is not providing any financial, economic, legal, accounting, or tax advice or recommendations in this podcast. In addition, the receipt of this podcast by any listener is not to be taken as constituting the giving of investment advice by Sprott to that listener, nor to constitute such person a client of any Sprott entity. Past performance is no indication of future results.